Okay, so today uh, we're going to uh, uh, calculate the space-time propagator for a free particle, which is the easiest case, um, using a completely different uh, formulation or formalism. Uh, one that was found by Richard Feynman in about 1948. It's the Clark integral formulation of quantum mechanics. Now this is fundamental to uh, statistical mechanics and quantum field theory, high energy physics and also statistical mechanics. So if you're going on in any of those uh, subjects next year, uh, this is a really important. The, uh, much of what we're doing today is actually done in an elementary way in Suskin 2, chapter 9. But it's also done in a very easy to understand, very nicely explained way in this book here, Quantum Mechanics and Path Integrals by Feynman and Hibbs. Particularly this edition, edition here, okay, this M-ended M edition. Uh, I highly recommend this uh, if you're going on with physics um, in, in one of the theory groups. This is, it's got a large section at the end on, on applications to statistical mechanics. Um, and it's got a lot of examples of how to calculate uh, path integrals um, in uh, you know, quantum mechanical path integrals for, for a lot of different cases as well as in the momentum representation as well. So if you're going on with physics I highly recommend you read this book because you're going to end up doing um, path integrals a lot in high energy physics and in um, you know, quantum gravity or in all sorts of places. Okay, so we're going to calculate the space-time propagator, the free particle space-time propagator, and then we'll actually show in general that the space-time propagator calculating using the Feynman formulism, the path integral formulation, really is the same as the Schrodinger uh, propagator. You really do uh, get the same thing, it's guaranteed. Finally, there is a whole class of problems where uh, calculating the space-time propagator is actually quite easy, apart from uh, the normalization constant. For the normalization constant, you should have a look at that book by Feynman and Hibbs. But when the, when the potential energy uh, has this form, uh, basically quadratic in x, and then you've got x dot here and a cross term x times x dot, any kind of uh, combination that looks like this is uh, quite quite easy to calculate and we'll, we'll show why at the end. Um, if you think about it, it's actually uh, very closely related to um, the discussion we had a few weeks ago on the classical limit. Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it, the reason is, is, very, is very similar. Okay, um, so here is, here is Richard Feynman um, and when playing, playing bongos around about the 1960s I think when, when he was teaching at Caltech. Some of his quotes um, which I strongly recommend. <laughs> know how to solve every problem that has been solved. It's pretty tough, but you know, if you if you focus on your own field, then um, you know, just just try to learn how to solve everything, you know, just as much as possible at least. You know. The more you know, the more the more techniques you see, the more not just techniques, but the more physics you see, uh, the the more you learn, uh, the more intuition you learn, the more feeling you get for for how to move forward. And then the second one, um, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. Right, and he, he won the Nobel Prize in 1965. Um, you can read the rest of these for yourself. Right, so a few weeks ago, uh, in fact, I think that um, you, you would have done, hopefully by today, you would have calculated the um, free particle, this, the space time propagator uh, for a free particle in one dimension, uh, just uh, by evaluating uh, this integral is basically uh, just using this formula. You get that the propagator, uh, we're putting t equal to zero, the starting time to zero, is this this 
constant here. Um, and in fact, uh, if you look at here, what you have is half n x minus x prime squ squared divided by t. Well, it's quadratic in space and linear in time. Yeah. Okay. And also, there's, a, there's an h bar in, in the denominator there, and there's an i in the numerator. Now, if that i came down to here in the, in the denominator, you'd have to multiply by minus 1, right? And then this would be a Gaussian, look, it would look like it had the form of a Gaussian integral. And then that there would just be the normalization of a Gaussian integral. Okay, so that's so that's why you have m on two pi h bar i t. Two pi h bar, by the way, is h Planck's constant. So this is m over h i t, the square root of m over h i t here. Okay, so um, now that is a lot less. Uh, you, you know, when you first saw this, it looks like you know it's quite. You know, shocking in a sense because you've got a, a complex i in the denominator and a square root and all this, but um, it's got to become a lot more um, familiar to you. Okay, so um, because you've just had the exam, you would be pretty familiar with what the propagator u of t is. I'm not going to go through this bit here. You can read it for yourself if you haven't. Already. Okay, yeah. Can the degeneracy be continuous? Sorry? Can the degeneracy be continuous? Yeah. I mean, hang on, what does degeneracy mean? Degeneracy is continuous. You can have a continuous eigenvalue. Yeah, but then the can the degenerate states uh, in for a particular eigenvalue can they be instead of like labeled by one, two, three, can they be continuous? But if they're continuous I mean, so you can have, <coughs> well, think of, <coughs> you, you answer him, Spash. Like, do you mean, like, I, I, mean, I just want to control what he's saying. Do you mean, like, uh, so you, you have, say, from E to E plus something, all the values in between yeah. that are yeah. degenerate? Yeah. Like, instead of just having E plus and E minus, can we have, like, a range? Um, If you have a range, then it's not. Then that means that they're not equal. What, what they're not, so they're not degenerate. What do you mean a range? Like uh, instead of just two functions, because in in the degenerate case for <coughs> e, for example, mm -hmm. we have just the plus case and the minus case. Mm -hmm. Can we have an entire continuous range of functions or something? Yes, you can have an entire. Uh, 2 pi of 0 to 2 pi of angles, for example, for a, um, in the xy model of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, a magnetic, one of the uh, magnetic models in, we might look at, maybe we look at in SP3, um, the energy where the spin points, the magnetic moment points in any direction in the plane is the same energy. Yeah, so that answers the question. Yeah. Okay, so just to remind you, you, you would have um, you would have studied this uh, um, just a few just a few days ago for the exam, but just to remind you that uh, this, the propagator to, to, to know the uh, wave function at time t in the x basis, you need to calculate this integral where this is the wave function at the start in the x basis at, at the starting time, which is t prime. And you have to multiply it by the, by the propagator uh, matrix element in the x basis and integrate over all possible, uh, all, all possible initial states. 
So this is the final state, x and t, and you integrate over all possible initial states, x prime, t, x prime, uh, positions, x prime, at time t prime, um, and and then you get, and so you get psi of x t, and um, really, uh, what's the psi of x prime t prime is a complex amplitude that the particle is at x prime at, at time t prime. There's t prime. Oops, there's t prime there. Time is on this on this axis, and and x prime space is up here, and so, and this is uh, the real part. This is of, of course of just the of the of the uh, initial wave function. And so each point along here is weighted with a particular complex number. And then uh, the, prop the integral um, tells you what the amplitude of the particle is, uh, will, will be at this point. Uh, and it's an integral over all of these points here. That's, that's what this is here. But if you pick the initial uh, wave function uh, to be a delta function, then the propagator, then the propagator, integral of the propagator with the dollar function. The dollar function just picks out a particular point uh, where the dollar function is located at x naught prime, and this this x prime uh, ranges over all initial positions and eventually it equals x naught prime, and that so this integral just picks out x naught prime. So then the amplitude um, of the wave function. Given that the initial wave function was a delta function, the amplitude of the wave function um, at, the, at the particular space-time point xt is just equal to the propagator. So that tells us that the propagator uh, is, uh, it, it tells us how a point source uh, of, uh, of amplitude, if you like, uh, spreads out um, in, in space and time. And uh, that's, also, that's the idea of a Green's function as well. So it's essentially what's what we found is a Green's function. And that's just some, like, some, something that you'll hear more of next semester in QM3, um, but also in um, statistical mechanics, condensed matter physics, and um, high energy physics next year, uh, whoever's going on to that. Uh, so um, this, is, this looks like a diffusion through space time, and it, and it is. The Schrodinger equation is a kind of diffusion equation. But it's also a kind of wave equation because you get interference effects. Just a, a reminder, a representation of a delta function. Uh, in fact, in MP1, we studied this. That uh, first of all, uh, the representation is in terms of finite, which means non-zero, um, like a parameter epsilon, and it's just a function of x that depends on this epsilon as well. And as, it, as epsilon tends to zero, this function tends to infinity, um, but the integral of the function over all space equals one for all epsilon, something that you can that you prove. Right? And then and then this is if it, if this holds, then this is a representation of the direct delta function. Um, and you know, one example is uh, is the Gaussian uh, um, with standard deviation epsilon. So it's just under there epsilon, and uh, and then it's, and that's the normalized Gaussian, and that's the normalization. That's, that's epsilon squared. There. It's a bit messy. It's epsilon squared. So just keep in mind that that's, that the Gaussian, this normalized Gaussian, is a representation of the direct delta function. That's an example you did in um, MP1. And also, just just to remind you before we start, the fundamental theorem of calculus that the integral um, of a derivative of a function, derivative, say with respect to t of some function uh, dt, is equal. Uh, it's a definite integral, so that equals the function evaluated at the endpoints um, f of x minus f of a. Okay. Now, if in particular, if x, um, this should be a plus epsilon. Yeah. If uh, if x 
uh, is a is just epsilon away from a, and say epsilon is, is positive. If it's if it's epsilon away from a, so very very close to a, so then that's just epsilon times df by um, dt. Evaluated at t equals a is supposed to be. What do you mean? Uh, you made a correction as we could make a subsum. Yeah. So you mean what tends to zero? Yeah. Oh, epsilon. Epsilon. Yeah. Epsilon tends to zero, of course. All right. So what's uh, Feynman's path integral recipe for the propagator? Um, first of all, cons let's contrast it with the Schrodinger approach. This, in the Schrodinger equation, the Schrodinger equation is a is a differential equation and so it's, it's, it's a local view a local local means that at any point in, in the neighborhood of any space-time point X and T um, the wave function is related to uh, the wave function at X and T by the differential operator L the differential operator tells the wave function how to bend how to, how to bend and how to um, you know, how high it has to be, what slope it has to have in the next, in, in, very, in, in the neighborhood of any time, any space time point. And then you, you kind of move forward um, in that, into that neighborhood, and the, the, the linear operator tells you how to move forward from there, and so on and so on throughout the domain of, uh, of the differential equation. So that's how the, you know, that's how the differential equation kind of uh, fills out the domain, if you like, and, and defines the, the function psi of xt. So it's a local view, okay, so because you're, you're looking at particular single points x of t, space-time points xt, and seeing what the function is in the neighborhood, and just, and just continuing on. But Feynman had a completely different idea, and um, he, he he said, okay, look, uh, suppose that we just know the initial point and the final, and we're interested in the amplitude for the particle to be at a final space-time point xt, and, uh, and, and we know the Lagrangian, um, then, um, then, well, this is, a, this is going to be now a path integral formulation, so in, an, in um, we know that that's a global view because you're given the end points and you are um, you are uh, going to look at paths, every path that joins uh, the two end points. Okay, um, and for each path, each path, say this one, you work out the action, the action. Uh, for that path, and then for, and and then you give this path uh, 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 co a complex amplitude of unit of unit modulus. It's just a complex number of unit modulus. Okay, and you do that for every path. Why do we give it? Why do we give? Why do we make the action a complex uh, exponential? Mm -hmm. Um, where does it really come from? I mean, that was his insight. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we're not minimizing that. Uh, you will, yeah. yeah. Um, so you just basically add all. You, you work out either the I and H bar S for every path. Now that's going to be a different complex number for each unit. path, yeah. but, uh, but it's always unit magnitude. And what is S in this case? It's... Uh, what action? It, it's the, it's the, uh, the <coughs> classical action. <coughs> you'll, you'll find it in a minute. Yeah. So, and then, and then, the, then what he said is, well, look. If you add up all those, all those complex unit magnitude complex numbers, and normalize it, 
you get the space time propagator. Good way. A priori, it a priori doesn't make sense. Maybe after doing it. <laughs> this is the recipe. <laughs> We'll, work, we'll prove it in a, in a, in a few minutes. I don't think any kind of intuition can get you to this point. <laughs> maybe, maybe there's like a deeper thing. Than... It, yeah, there is, yeah. So uh, I've, I've handed out a few pages from Feynman and Hibbs, um, chapter one. So just read that. That's, that's like the, the, the path view um, of. of uh, um, I mean, we're going to derive this anyway. But you re read that for. The, those pages from the first chapter, and, and that's it. That's that's the recipe. Oh, except you have to find the normalization as well. Okay. Um, so every path is weighted equally in the sense that the the complex number has um, has a unit magnitude and. Uh, then you might ask, well, hang on, what if the particle has a mass of, you know, a kilogram in, and it's just a classical particle? And how can um, the, how can this recover the classical path? If you're just weighting each path with a, with a complex number of unit magnitude, how can it, um, how can you get a classical path? Well, the thing is that um, the complex number is, Is, is this now? Let's say. Let's say that this is the classical path, um, and this is e to the i on h bar s classical. Now, it turns out that uh, relative that if I, if I that let's just for argument's sake say that for this path here, if I go e to the i on h bar s of this path. Um, now here is a circle of unit magnitude, and and um, so, and, and you know, this is say the um, complex plane and polar coordinates. So let's say that the phase of of this one of this path. Let's say let's say this is a classical path, and let's say I'm, I'm actually very close to it. This is this is obviously highly exaggerated, but let's say I'm very close to this path, and this is this close path. Like kind of epsilon away in some sense, okay? Um, then there's zero phase, phase angle. Let's say that this one has, let's for argument's sake, say that that has a phase angle of, of this much compared to, compared to that. But it's very small. But it's, yeah, but, or, you know, yeah, it, it's gonna be relatively small. Yeah. And, and on this side, and I'm, I'm epsilon away, I'm very close, highly exaggerated, okay? Mm -hmm. Very close. Um, this has got a, a complex number associated with it. And let's say that the phase is in the opposite direction, but let's say it's this much away. If I add those three numbers, the total is going to be roughly, you can add them like vectors. Um, and let's say it's going to be roughly you know, around, around here somewhere. Okay? If I add those three numbers. Similarly, you know, because this is, because this is um, basically kind of like a real continuous Thing. I, I could put in um, um, paths in between there, and they have all phases um, between there and there, etc. Because that, that's up until say around here. So in other words, all of these paths, all of these complex numbers, add, they're kind of all in the kind of forward direction like this. And, they, and, and after you add all that up, you've got you know, some vector way out here somewhere. I've got a vector phase order. The phase of diagram. Mm -hmm. But we chose the classical path we are doing. Well, well, um, I'm just, I'm just um, pointing out how this works. So there's a classical path. Well, I don't care what the classical path is. If if the classical path is there, I'm telling you, look, just look at some very close, very the paths that are not the classical path but are very close to it. But can I do that with every other path? Sorry. Can't I do that with every other path? Sorry. Can't I do that this approach with every other path and then? Every path. No, 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 no. I'm, 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 the, the classical path is special. We're going to see that the classical path is special. We've got to prove all this. What do you mean? You add them all together and you get something over there? What, what do you mean by that? Um, 
this 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 complex number plus this complex oh, number okay. is going to give a complex number that's about this. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So now, what if I have a path that's that's out here? <laughs> <laughs> when in fact, no. Let, 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 before I go out there, and, and okay, okay, let, let, let's do that. that. That's going to be maybe there. And but um, eventually, what's going to happen past a certain point? Uh, not point, but a kind of distance away from the from the classical path. What's going to happen is that is that the rate at which the phase changes as you go as you choose paths further and further away, the rate at which the phase changes is fast, becomes faster and faster. So then. So between here and here, the phase the phases are all kind of between there and there. They're all this is called coherent addition. Coherent addition means that on the on the whole, it's adding in a positive way. If you move past the, past that point, then they start adding in a negative way. That's one thing. Secondly. When you go past a certain range, the the rate at which the phase changes from neighbouring paths increases. So that means you start adding random numbers, uh, random phases. Essentially, you can fill out fill out a whole circle of random phases past past the like a certain region in the middle. So as in, and and the, the rate. Is dependent, of course, on the complex exponential. Yeah, the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. The action, the action right. right? And so, what happens that is that past a past a rough rough range of, away from here, away from here, you are adding uh, random. essentially random random phases on a circle, which average to zero. So, it's like the so the only thing that the only paths that contribute. Are the, co the ones that give coherent addition in the neighborhood of the classical path? It's like sine x by x. It's like sine x by x when you did the yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, it is. Right, right. It is. What, it? what do you mean by random? Is it no, no, random, is random isn't, isn't the right word. It's not random. It's just that, that, that the phase yeah, varies very quickly yeah. and they're all in a unit circle. And it is certainly not. Um, co it is certainly not according to some pattern. Okay. There's no accidental pattern. Okay. It's all. It, this is going to be. Um, it's going to fill the, the circle um, more and more and more. It's not like some accidental pattern that that gives some non-zero number. This is going to be. It's going to be essentially equivalent to random phase. It's not random, but it's going to be. Um, it's going to average to zero. Okay, and, but the fact that it averages to zero is itself like a pattern. Or, or, or no, that's the lack of a pattern. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's how it works, and that is called the essentially the uh, the um, uh, this is essentially what's called stationary phase. Now, stationary phase. There's also a general method of approximating integrals called the method of stationary phase. Right? And, and, and that's, you, you see that in any mathematical science. Right? And this is just an example of it, except it's uh, applied in quantum mechanics and to path integrals, which is a, a functional integrals, which are a bit more complicated than the usual um, application to applied maths and engineering and stuff. Yeah. So it's but it's a random but it's called stationary phase because there's a region in the middle where the phase is addition is coherent and then sort of away from there you get incoherent addition that averages to zero. Okay? And also the action of the classical is taken as in in, in the it, Yes, exactly. So so it's it's um it's built on the mid action, the um, least action principle, of least action. So what do you mean by the, the action? Station? You see them now. We, we minimize the action. Yeah. Oh, okay. See them now. But that's how it works. Okay. 
So in terms of pictures, that's it. It's really simple. Okay? Right. In fact, um, the condition, the, the coherent addition condition is, is this here. Um, basically, the action of your path that you're looking at minus the classical action divided by h bar, or the modulus of that has to be around about pi. As long as that's true, that, that tells you the range of coherent addition. And up, or beyond that, you're going to get incoherent addition that averages to zero. Okay. Is that clear? Is that quite clear? Yeah, good. Okay, that's, so that's how it works. All right. Um, so let's just have a look at uh, some examples. So before we actually prove anything, I want to see some examples. I don't want to. I don't want to dive into the notation. I want to see the examples first. Right. So yes, consider a free particle leaving the origin at t equals zero and arriving at, at x equals one centimeter in t equals one second. So there's t equals one second, and there is. Um, x equals one centimeter, and it's a free particle, so its trajectory we know is a straight line. And so we, we, we let's we know that the classical path is x equals t. Yeah. Okay, we know that. Um, so x dot of t equals one centimeter per second. It says ten to the minus two meters a second. Okay. So now the Lagrangian, which we're going to need, is it's an uncharged particle, so it's just T minus V. And there's no potent, there's potent, no potential energy because it's a free particle. So that's just P squared over 2N. So that's just half MX dot squared because we're, this is Lagrangian mechanics now, not Hamiltonian mechanics. Okay, half MX dot squared. So the classical action is the integral, defined as the integral from TI to TF of the Lagrangian. So that's half n times integral from 0 to 1 of x dot squared, right? But what's x dot squared? x dot squared is just 1. So that's just half m um, x dot squared. But um, it's just, sorry, not just 1. It's actually 10 to the minus 2 because it's meters per second. So we're going to um, stay with uh, um, SI units, okay? So that's um, half m times 10 to the minus 4 joule seconds. Joule seconds. Yeah. So that's the action. Um, very often uh, you, you will notice that you will read that the dimensions of h bar are, are called the action dimensions. It's a, it's a word that's quite commonly used, action dimensions. And, um, that's, um, and you see that that has the same uh, units as h bar, yeah. and so h bar has what's called action dimensions because because of this. Anyway, now consider a different path x of t equals t squared. Now do the same thing. You've got x dot there, right down the Lagrangian. It's two m t squared, um, and then let's call this one s two. So that's um, the action is 2m integral 0 to 1 of t squared, which gives you 2 thirds m times 10 to the minus 4 joule seconds. Now, find the difference between the actions. It's um, 3 on 2 minus a half uh, m, which is a half, that's well, supposed to be um, times 10 to the minus 4. This is a 1 on 6m times 10 to the minus 4 uh, joule seconds. That's the difference in action. Now what about uh, the phase? What, what about the ratio of the phase of path two compared, what, what's the phase of path two, e to the phase of path two compared to the, the path one? In other words, what's this complex number that we assign to path two divided by the complex number we assign to path one? It's e to the iron h by s2 divided by e to the iron h by s classical. That's e to the i on h bar times delta s. That's e to the i on h bar 1 sixth m 10 to the minus 4. Okay? So that if the mass is 1 gram, then, then already the, the path that's um, at t squared, what's t squared? t squared uh, from, it goes below 
1 if it's, if it's from 0 to 1. That's t squared. That's, that's that path there. Already, um, the phase of that path is 1.6 times 10 to the 26 radians. Okay? That's a, lar that's a large number of radians. What does that mean? It means that if you add up the, the phase of all the paths from here all the way up to, to, to there, um, you're already very deeply into the region of incoherent adding. This is a very large phase out here, this T squared phase. Right? It means that, that, the, um, that the range of coherence for the particle of mass 1 gram is very close to, to there, extremely close to there. And it means that essentially it's a classical particle. Okay? But if the mass is... Um, How do we know that? Because of the inequality that we just saw. Right? No, um, well, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I haven't actually defined how, what the range of coherence is. I haven't calculated it here. And I will, I'll, I'll do that in another example a little bit further on. But, but, the, but, the whole, but the point is that really this is um, deep into the uh, region of incoherent addition and so these parts out here just, just make no difference to the, to the, um, the total, the, the sum yeah. of, of, uh, um, of the, the propagator, make no difference. They make no difference to the propagator. They don't add the propagator at all. It's already random. Added. It's pretty well. Um, I'll call it incoherent mm -hmm. addition because mm -hmm. it, technically it's not really random. It's just um, incoherent. Uh, just incoherent. Yeah. yeah. It's an average. Mm -hmm. Average of zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, whereas now, what if the mass of a particle is ten to the minus thirty kilograms? Um, that's an electron going at one centimeter per second, and, and and forget about spin as well. So the electron going at one centimeter per second, and um, then then what you get is um, that the phase is e to the i times one on six, and so the phase changes much less than pi. In fact, the difference the difference in phase between Sorry, let me just let's just draw it here. Oh, here it is. It said the difference in phase between um, the, the the quadratic path and the linear path is just um, e to the i times one on six, which is uh, within the range of coherent addition. Basically, the, the, these two complex numbers are um, adding positively, if you like, to each other. And so is every other part in between. So there's a sense in which the electron is traveling through space in, in, in somehow, um, it's sort of spread out in space. It starts off at this point here, but it's somehow spread out through all of space, kind of out, that, out to a macroscopic distance. And, um, and sort of, if you measure it here, it will, it's the amplitude for it to be there. Yeah, so it's, it's really a prediction for experiment. So this is really giving you uh, uh, an image of how quantum, how spread out quantum, are, quantum particles are in space. And they're actually confined to, not confined is the wrong word, they're actually, um, they're, they're spread out in space a certain distance and you can quantify what distance that is. If, they, if, they, if you're asking the question, um, what's the amplitude of measuring it there, given that it starts there, then it would spread out in space that much, that particular distance there. Okay? So it gives you some, uh, some insight into, there's some pretty fundamental insight of how quantum particles um, diffuse through space and how far out they go. Yeah, isn't this just like a, a one-dimensional case? So what do you mean by spreading out? Um, because this is just x versus, versus, versus time. So. Yeah, it means that um, so if it's in one dimension then 
it's kind of the wave function, if it starts off um, like that, then the wave function would, um, would, would spread out through space. It would tend to go that way, tend to move forward, but it would also, um, um, you, you, there would also be an aperture to finding it kind of before where it should be at that time. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, in fact, you can you can calculate how far it is. I'll, I'll do that here. It's two point five millimeters. <laughs> so the, the the biggest distance oh, is two and a half millimeters. Out that way and out that way. So before the particle actually reaches the place, you can measure. No, you can't measure it. Not measure, but like it's you can, you, it. you you can potentially measure it. You, you can yeah, you, yeah. yeah that's As right. a, it's, there's a possibility that it's all probability that it's already there. Right. Whether we can measure it or not. It's, well, well, there is a probability where well, you can measure it, but if you do, you change it. You know? Yeah, you found it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So what this is is a prediction for experiment. Okay. Mm. And prediction for measure. So why the classical approach works is because the masses are much higher, and that's and it, it makes the deviation from the classical path so little, basically. It it um, if the, if the mass is high, then the range of the coherent region is very small, very tiny and around the classical path. Then to the stationary path. To the stationary, yeah, stationary phase path. Mm. The, the range of the stationary phase region is extremely small in the classical approximation. Um, and so, for example, if I had um, um, if, this, if, if you had like the equivalent of, of two dimensions, the two dimensional case, you could put a, um, like a, 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 a slit, like a, 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 a double slit or something, and do a double slit experiment, and you'll have the electron moving through both holes at once. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it interferes with itself? Yeah. Because it's ahead of ahead in time or something. So it can be yeah. yeah. And it basically it, it tries all tracks. Yes. And chooses the the path. It doesn't choose any particular path. Until it's, it's impossible for us to know any particular path. It seems to be spread out in space. That's all we can say. It's also dangerous to um, interpret any kind of local realism to this. Like the particle is like a puddle, some water that's flowing across a shallow surface. It's a nice picture, but um, water is something you can stick your finger in and, oh, look, there it is, there it is, that's how far it is, and then it still keeps flowing. But if you do that to the electron, you change everything. So this is before, this is, happens before any measurement you do. But you can, you can do, you can make an ensemble and confirm this picture by making many measurements. Hmm. Okay, so um, let's just um, also before we prove the uh, it's a derive it, let's derive the, the general case. Let's um, or is it just the classical case, uh, the um, free particle case? Um, oh, it's now completely obvious why the concept of a trajectory through space time is irrelevant in quantum mechanics. I mm -hmm. hope. Yeah, it's 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 you know you can't talk about the trajectory of that electron, of an electron, from that point to that point. It's you know, in in a classical sense. It's not like a billiard ball going like that. It's it's just spread out through space somehow. It goes through all possible paths, not just paths in space, but sort of paths in space time. It just seems to slow down, or speed up, or whatever. Um, so let's just have a look at uh, calculate an approximate free particle propagator, um, just to uh, get the hang of the um, the um, notation. So uh, okay, actually, we've argued in a, in a very non-precise way uh, that in, to an excellent approximation, we can ignore all but the classical part and its neighbours in calculating the propagator. Uh, we have not yet prove, proven um, this quantitatively, and we have not even proven, proved, proven yet 
that the U of T calculator really is the shredding and propagating, but we'll do that later on. For now, let's just, um, let's just do something quite interesting. So for the free particle, let's assume that every part that adds coherently contributes to the same, the same complex number, e to the i and h bar s classical. Okay, so, so, every, so we're assuming that for the free particle, every part just adds the same number, e to the i and h bar s classical. Okay, sounds crazy. Or the tensor, uh, or the collateral, like it has a one year, one year. Ah, except yeah, you're adding the same number. Oh. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so the same number for each part. Yeah, in the region. Anyway, oh. every part. Let's just assume every part adds coherently with the okay. same number. Okay. So it's, it doesn't converge. Oh, it does. Oh, it doesn't. It's like a summation. Oh, yeah. Something comes. Oh, it's a zero modulus. Ah, we'll see, we'll see. All right. So, so the propagator, according to the Feynman recipe, is just a sum of all parts of of this of the complex number e to the i and h by times the um, action of, of that part. But we re we replace this action of the different parts, which is a single action, the the classical action. And then there's some normalization A prime. Yeah. Um, in fact, A prime, it, it, if you think about it, it, it sort of measures the, the width or the number of paths in the coherent range. It sort of, uh, it, it's got to be because these are these are unit. This is these are unit modulus, and this gives it the non-unit modulus yeah. factor. So that's like the number of paths that actually contribute that. So, yeah, yeah. That it, it, it is a measure of it. Yeah. Yeah, you can't count the parts, but you can um, you can calculate a measure. So the normalization constant gives you an idea about the width of the coherent region. region. Yeah. Um, now the classical path of a free particle starting at this initial point and ending at x of t is just a straight line. Okay, it's a straight line that starts at that point and ends at that point, and the slope of the straight line is just the average velocity. So it's the final x minus the initial x um, and the final divided by the final t minus the initial t. This is the slope in space time. Okay? And um, and x prime, this is the initial x prime, and at any time t double primes, we need a we need a second uh, a third time here. T double prime um, minus t prime is the time after the initial time. And T double prime is any time from the initial time to the final time, T prime, from T prime to T. Okay, so this is a function of T double prime. So that there is a is a free uh, parameter, and uh, T prime is known. Um, X prime, X and T are all known. And the uniform velocity, V of T, v of, uh, t double prime is um, is the classical velocity. Um, as a function of t double prime, and, and that's just uh, the classical position um, derivative uh, with respect to t, t in, with respect to t double prime, and that's just a constant x minus x prime over t minus t prime. That's just um, that's the classical velocity, of course. Okay, that's delta x over delta t essentially. But the Lagrangian, the Lagrangian is um, is um, is um, Half mx dot uh, mxcl dot squared, and because the potential energy is zero for a free particle, um, and and that's x minus x prime over t minus t prime squared. Okay, that's the Lagrangian. Half m x minus x prime t minus t prime squared. So we've got x minus x prime squared and t minus t prime squared. Okay, and that's a constant. A free particle. Okay. Now the classical action is the integral of the Lagrangian from the initial to the final time, um, and so that's just uh, since that's all just a constant, that just comes out, and you're just integrating one from t prime to t, which gets rid of one factor of t minus t prime in the denominator. Okay. Yep. So um, now the propagator um, we claim. <laughs> Is uh, a prime, uh, so the normalization constant, 
e to the i and h bar half m x minus x prime squared over t minus t prime. So what I said was that we've got to weight uh, each part with the same with the same um, um, with the same action. We've got sum over all paths, and 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 but we're going to give give each part the same action, and this a prime is going to be a measure of the part of the number of paths that are coherent and coherently. So we claim that, so there is the classical action that we just worked out, and we just need to find this normalization. But we already know what it is. You worked it out lots of times. Yeah. You know, not yet lots of times, you did it for what you're handing in today. So See that I there? Yeah. You put that I in, in, in there, yeah. I, and that becomes minus one times that, or minus that. Now that's a Gaussian integral. Yeah. And what's the normalization of that? It's, um, yeah, you just, okay, well, um, let's, let's, let's just, um, we're almost there, let's just, um, let, let t tend to t prime, um, then u must tend to the delta function point source. Uh, oh, um, because that's a Gaussian, and that has the form of, of, the, delta form of, the, delta of the delta function. Okay. There it is there. So there's the, there's the representation of the delta function that I just mentioned at the start. So there's your epsilon as the width of the delta function, and then that's what we had in the previous line. There. So your um, so your epsilon is basically one over, or well, I accept that i has to go there because you, you got a minus sign there. You see, um, so minus epsilon squared is two h bar t minus t prime over i n. If you if you, if you just check that, you, you'll see that that's right. Um, and so minus epsilon squared is minus i two h bar t minus t prime over m. So the normalization constant is. Uh, square root of m over Planck's constant times i times t minus t prime. Now we'll put t prime equal to zero, um, which we can do if the if the um, if the if the um, Lagrangian oops if the Lagrangian is independent of time. Then uh, then any then then, um, then it doesn't matter if we pick out a particular time as the origin, then t prime equals zero, put t prime equals zero, and we get the propagator that looks familiar. So how does the normalization constant tell us about the region? Well, it's got to, because uh, because th this is the weight. Yeah, the, the weight of all the parts is is, is a unit has unit modulus, yeah. and um, def and somehow this I mean this 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 might not be unit modulus mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, for a particular x combination of, mm -hmm. of argument. Um, so this is this has got to back. It's got to be that part there. And. And, and also, in, in look at the form of this. This is a sum over all parts of um, of, of of that, <coughs> where this action changes for each part. But we're saying, well, look, let's just give the same complex number to each one. Okay. And, and then tells us what can you use this to get like a, an approximation of all the ranges after that. Of the, of the ranges after that, of the coherent ranges. Yes. So, um, so really, um, so really, um, I mean, the surprising thing is that, in a sense, all the information yeah. is, is in the normalization. And the normalization has very important, um, you know, has got a lot of information in it. So the range is the, is the is in a sense the, uh, the the coherent range, the range of coherent addition. 
the nut count is like a measure of the number of clouds. How is it like by looking at the normalization constant, this one? Mm -hmm. But I, I don't see what information it contains. Okay. Um, You'd have to find a way of extracting it. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that now. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's beside the point. Yeah, because it, we already know the condition. But it's got to have that interpretation. Mm -hmm. But this, the, the amazing thing is that this agrees with the calculation that we got using bargain functions from the Schrodinger equation. Mm -hmm. um, now, why could we... Why could we do that? Why, why does it work? Um, basically, we were lucky that the potential energy was of this form. Is that special form that I wrote? Now, the, for potential energies of any, uh, it, whenever the potential energy is of this form, we can use that trick. Basically, weight all the paths by um, the classical action, um, e, uh, the, the phase of the of the exponential to be the classical action, basically, divided by h bar. And, um, and then uh, we just work out the normalization. We will prove that um, in a little while. Okay. Um, but if you actually think carefully about it, at this point here, we let t tend to zero, and we compared the uh, the standard deviation of the Gaussian um, here with the Gaussian here and said, okay, well, well then from that we can tell um, uh, what, we, we know that uh, the normalization of the standard Gaussian is there, therefore we know what the normalization is here. But we're very lucky that um, in here, in here there is not, there is no function Let's call it f of uh, t and t prime, which goes to one as t tends to zero, as t tends to zero, right, and is dimensionless. What if there was some function in here um, that tends to one as t tends to zero? Then this, then it's, then this would not be true for arbitrary time. Yeah. Right. So that you could you could argue you could um, give an objection to this procedure by saying, oh, hang on, uh, there is um, there could be this type of function here, dimensionless, like just a number, but the number goes to one as t tends to zero, and in that case, this a prime would be wrong. However, that's not possible. Um, because the normalization constant must only contain a combination of m, h bar, and t. The reason it, it must have a combination only of m, h bar, and t, because that's what's up in the exponent in, in, the, in the phase, m, h bar, and t. So the normalization can only cons contain those. And it's impossible to make a dimensionless combination of m, h bar, and t. It's just something that you'd have to sit down and think about. Okay, so that's that's something that you know that uh, it's a, it's a, it's it's a very important objection, but and somebody can make it, but then you can prove, then you can argue this. Okay. All right. So let's just do, do, let's just prove this quantitatively now. I mean, the, the, let's just derive the free particle pro propagated quantitatively. Oh, I think the big exit, right? The exit on towards the right. 
I don't need to get there. Okay, maybe fuck it, we'll do that. It should be X. Pause. Yep, there we go. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. Okay, so um, let's do this quantitatively. So the first thing to do is to uh, um, slice up time in our space time. Here's, here's time, here's space. And slice up time into time slices from T0 up until Tn. And, and for argument's sake, we'll, we'll give them uh, the, same, the same width. It doesn't matter. And, um, and then you now the Lagrangian, the exact expression for the, um, for the action is integral from T0 up to Tn all the way of Lagrangian um, dt. And for the free particle, it's just half mx dot squared. That's the Lagrangian. That's the exact. But now if we discretize time, then the uh, integral turns into a sum y equals 0 to n minus 1. And the discretized uh, Lagrangian becomes, there's m on 2. And now x dot squared becomes xi plus 1 minus xi divided by the, uh, the delta, the, the width of the time interval. We call it epsilon. Okay? Squared. And now dt is going to be epsilon. Put it there, epsilon there. Now to integrate over all paths, you need to take into account all the paths. But how do you do that? Well, uh, if you start at x0 there, uh, you go to all possible x, x's at time t equals 1. So from here, you go there, you go there, all possible paths there, and you, you add up all the uh, these complex numbers, either the IH bar times the action, for paths going from x0 to all possible points here. Then, For here, for each here, you do the same thing. Look at all possible paths in one time step, or all possible endpoints in one time step, and integrate that, and so on and so on until you get to until you get to there and then it's just that and so what happens is that uh, that's if you uh, if you think about it that's one way of taking into account all paths from x naught to xn um, in fact, what happens as well in the integral is that, uh, uh, we'll, we'll get to it in a minute, the, the, the middle variables disappear. Anyway. And then finally, after you, after you do all that, you let the number of time slices tend to infinity, and epsilon tends to zero, such that the number of it, time slices times the width of each time slice tends to the time interval we're interested in, t minus t prime. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The action that we've used is a general action, not not the, it doesn't use the classical. Really, yeah, not, not the classical no. action, right. right. So, now in fact what we're doing is integrating over uh, what we're re really doing here is um, integrating, eventually after, you, after the limit process at the end, you're integrating over all possible paths. That, <coughs> uh, uh, um, and so the notation, so, so it's called a functional integral because you are 
uh, calculating the action for an entire function, entire path, and um, the function x of t maps, uh, the, the functional maps the path into a complex number, e to the r and h bar times the action of this x, and that's symbolized by that, that's, that's symbolized by this uh, script d and square brackets, and this has the the path there, and there's the complex weight for each path, and the integral is from x naught, the initial point starting point of the particle and the final point of the particle. And this notation, uh, integral, and this can be any, this can be whatever, and this D here means integrate that over all paths connecting x0 to xn. Now, so Feynman had the insight to slice up space-time like that and then have the limit, limit process, make the limit process, do the limit process. And in symbols, so the space-time propagator is the integral um, from x naught to xn into the i h bar times the action of any of the path um, d of the path. Okay, this is the exact, um, this, is, this is the definition, if you like, of u. Okay, in the continuous space time, in continuous space time, and then you did, this is the discretized version here. And the claim is that if you take the limit as n to infinity, epsilon tends to zero, such that n epsilon tends to the time interval you're interested in, then that equals that, and that that propagator that you calculate is the same as the Schrödinger propagator. And here you've got. Um, this is this is an, this is n minus one integrals for each of the time slices. You have this is the discretized version. You have n minus one in, oops n minus one integrals for each time slice. So over dx one up to dx n minus one. So you have n minus one integrals here. That's n minus one. Yes. Okay. So yeah. The D is just a symbol. It has no uh, like value. It's no, it's no, yeah, it's just simply it, in uh, normal integration. So Riemann integration or um, it's like it's using you know, DT. Yeah. But because TT is uh, um, a continuous variable, yeah. well, here you have not a continuous variable but a function. It's a functional integral. Okay. Mm. Um, so. First thing uh, is rewrite the, each of these integrals in terms of um, dimensionless variables. So the dimensionless variable is um, going to be y i, and and you define it to be that, and that that just comes straight out of there. It's obvious that um, that if you look at this, then you know, the, the, this uh, um, it's obvious that that's going to be dimensionless. And then what you need to evaluate is this a prime constant. A prime is just um, the normalization constant in the dimensionless integral. Is n minus one integrals. Each has the form e to the minus one on i, sum from i equals zero to n minus one, y i plus one minus y i all squared. Okay. And um, and a prime and a are related like this. And now, so the way to uh, start evaluating this is to start with uh, y one, the integral over y one. So the integral over y one um, actually uh, in the integrand here, in the exponent you have. The sum of the differences. So these are adjacent. This is y2 minus y1 squared plus y3 minus y2 or squared plus etc. But the y1 integral, so the y1 integral um, here, the integrand, the other factor in the integrand that contains y1 is only this one. 
it contains, there's y2 minus y1 all squared plus y1 minus y0 squared. That's the only factor that contains y1. Okay? And um, now, when you, when you calculate this integral, in fact, what will happen is the y1 will disappear. It's got to disappear. Um, why does it have to disappear? Because we know, remember back in, um, back in lecture four, we know that the propagator must have the composition property. That the propagator, if you, if you propagate the particle from T0 to T1, and then from T1 to T2, um, then that must equal, the, uh, this must be the same thing as propagating the particle from T0 to T2. In other words, that T1 has got to disappear. Not only that, you retain the same form of propagator. So the propagator uh, is a gas in there and a gas in there, and the integral of that must be a Gaussian where the T1 disappears. So it's the same, it's the same function? It's the same function basically, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's what, that's what we know must be true from um, this sort of that very fundamental assumption that we had made at the start because the propagator is essentially um, the time developed, is the um, Hamiltonian flow basically. From, from Hamiltonian mechanics in theory. Because the Hamiltonian is the generator of infinitesimal time translations and the propagator at infinitesimal time epsilon it must be very close to doing nothing. And it's I minus I and H by epsilon H. And for finite time translations, um, U of T equals that. And so you must have u of t2, t1, u of t1, t0 equals either the minus i and h bar h of h times t2 minus t1 times this propagator h times t1 minus t0 and obviously here this middle t1 is going to cancel out because there's a minus minus and there's a minus this is plus t1 that's a minus t1 so the middle t1 cancels out you get just the time difference, T2 minus T0 there, which is a propagator U of T2, T0. So that must also hold true for this integral here. So it should be a function of the difference, not the individual point. It's always a function of initial point and final point. Okay, but then it, if it's a function of the difference, then property would make sense. Uh, which, which is the case over here. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm not going to work through this, but this in fact, um, basically you just multiply all this out and you get, you get some, the, the, you get these middle term, this middle term here. And there's another y1 term there, but this is this integral is respect to y1. You, you can work through this detail by yourself. Maybe I'll just point out how it works. And that there's a the variable of integration here is y1, and y1 is there, y1 is there, and so y2 squared and y naught squared are like that. Um, and then you got the say the 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 the, the uh, the integral formula that we that we used before, uh, you've got a quadratic function in y1 there. You integrate it. You get you, you just um, work. You write down the recipe. You get that, and it seems like miraculously, what what we know from general principles must be true. Miraculously, what happens is that uh, these uh, y0, these cross products y0, y2 here, in fact, cancel out, or in fact, they don't cancel out, that becomes a difference of squares, y2 minus y0 squared, like that. So what happens is that the y1 has been eliminated because of the, uh, because you've integrated over it, but, so that's obvious, but what has happened also is that you've recovered the Gaussian form, right? But not only that, 
the denominator now in the um, in the uh, Gaussian had a two. Here it had a one. It is a one. It's a one. Now you've got a two. There. Uh, where is it? There, now you've got a two. Okay. So what's happened is that the Gaussian was this wide, now it's double the width. Or, or square root of two times the width. Okay. So the Gaussian is spread out after one time step. Okay. Does it double each thing? Or Not double. Um, in fact, um, so for the interval over the arbitrary yk, uh, we expect um, we expect a general form that looks like this. There's some factor at the front. So you've got an extra square root of pi i on, on 2 there. There's some factor there. Some factor, so one, some factor that's going to come out the front of the integral and some factor that's going to come in under the um, in the denominator there. And the question is, is it going to be, as, as you have just said, is it going to be times squared, or is it going to be, or is it going to be the same number of, as the time step? Right? So that's kind of a surprise. Right? Uh, but, um, okay. In fact, after k iterations of this, the result is here, you got in the denominator of the exponent k plus 1 after k iterations. So after one iteration, which we, cut, which we calculated, you get 2, so that's 1 plus 1, which is right. After k, you get k plus 1, so the denominator there is, is increasing um, linearly with k. Okay. And then the factor at the front is pi i to the k on 2 divided by k plus 1, square root of k plus 1. In fact, oh, so that's after, like, that's after k, after k iterations. You do after, after k, after k intervals. So it's not multiplied by k plus 1, it's, it is k plus 1. It is, th this has already been multiplied. Yeah. Yeah. That's why you've got, you got a power of k there. <coughs> um, and, in, and, that is in fact a normalized Gaussian after k iterations. So what that's telling us is that the that's telling us that the uh, Gaussian is spreading out at a constant rate at each time step. So the particle is diffusing through space time at a constant rate, um, and the amplitude or the normalization, if you like, or the number of uh, the number of paths, if you like. Um, the coherent paths is, is increasing in, at this rate. Oh, but, but isn't the period that it has an i? Sorry? Isn't the period that it has an i complex i? Is, is, sorry again? Isn't the period that it has an i as in we assume that a it stars a number of paths and it has uh, an imaginary number? No, no, I'm not saying it's a number of paths, it's a it's measure, a measure, measure of the number of paths. It's a difference. It's like Water is uncountable. A glass of water, the amount of water is uncountable, but you can measure it. it you know. yeah. um, okay, and this is, you can actually prove this. Not by induction. You can do it by induction, actually. I'll be, I'll be interested to see. It. Yeah. Um, oh, I did a, a, a so I guess a more clumsy way. By actually, you just put placeholders in like that. You just do three examples and, and you very quickly see what the pattern is. But I'd, I'd do it by induction. It's probably, by induction would probably be the, the best one. Um, the pattern is going to be immediately obvious. And you'll see how it works as well. Anyway, after n minus 1 integrals, in other words, you get to the other end, the result is pi i to the half times n minus 1 divided by square root of n. And in here you got n in the 
in there, and in the, and the if you got y n minus y zero squared, then you put in the non-dimensionless variables, uh, put the non non non-dimensionless variables back in, you get um, that times that blah blah, and then now the key is how do you take this limit? So you, you got to let n tend to infinity and epsilon tend to zero such that the product n epsilon equals that. Well. What that means is that you just, wherever you see n epsilon, you just put tn minus t0. So, um, well, in fact, um, what's going to happen here? Um, and, oh, 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 yeah, yeah. Um, yes, wherever you see n epsilon, you put in tn minus t0. Um, 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 oh, and the product. This thing here uh, has to equal one. You let that equal to one um, because yes, yes, yes. It's, it's a little normalization. Yeah. Oh, because um, why? Let me see. So it's going to give us the right answer. Mm -hmm. Some I, I mean, you can think about it. Uh, anyway, so so that immediately gives us the same space-time propagator, space-time propagator that we're that we are familiar with. And so this is from what's known as the, this is this is the exact calculation. So we've got the space-time propagator back. Well, what were you saying about measure around this one? Like, what do you mean? By um, As in this context, you, 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 you can have an I in, the, in your measure. It doesn't matter. It just depends on how you define how, how you use the measure. Or um, I don't, I'm not. I'm not saying this is the number of parts. I'm saying that it indicates the number of parts somehow. Maybe you have to take the complex conjugate you know, modulus squared or something. Mm. In fact, um, you know, I, I, I guess you know, I haven't. Um, made a connection between counting the number of paths or even measuring the number of paths, but you know that that has to have something to do with the number of variant paths. Yeah. Might be a bit white rubbery, but anyway, um, this A thing here, this A is the inverse of, of that, which is the square root of this in the brackets to the power of n. Right, and so call b that thing in square brackets um, to the power of a half. Okay? And then the, the, uh, the best way to write the original part integral is to put 1 over b there and then a b below each of these dx's under there, so that, that gives you b to the n, b to the n minus 1 times b there. Okay. So there's a, a two-page section, three-page section coming up, four-page, four-page section coming up. We can either have a break now or after the four-page section. What do you feel like? Do you, do you, how do you feel now? Feel like having a break, or should we just go on for another, say, 15 minutes and then have a break? Break now. Break now? No. Um, break now? no. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that, that's pretty heavy. You know, pretty heavy. What we're just doing. If you haven't seen this sort of thing before. Okay. So we'll have a break for 10, 10 or 15 minutes or so. All right. Let's uh, finish this off. <clears throat> so first, we'll prove in general that the Feynman formalism gives a propagator that really is. The same as the Schrodinger propagator. <laughs> um, so, and, but we're only for uncharged, but uncharged particles. So the Hamiltonian is just the sum of the potential and kinetic energies. In the Schrodinger formalism, uh, for very small time steps, and in fact, this is the key. The key is to look at uh, very small time steps because if you can prove it for one very short time step, then it will be true if you 
uh, link the time steps together. So uh, the, uh, the the Schrodinger, the time dependent Schrodinger equation is then um, is then just the <coughs> angle bracket in there. Uh, the ket psi at time epsilon minus the ket psi of zero uh, is minus i and h by epsilon h times the uh, ket psi equal zero. Um, okay, that should be clear to, to you right now. In the x basis, that's psi of x epsilon minus psi of x zero is uh, minus i and h bar times epsilon times, um, now the Hamiltonian is minus h bar squared on 2m d2 by dx squared plus v of x zero. And all this acting on psi of x zero. And that's the first order in epsilon. So we're taking epsilon to be small enough so that you can just keep the uh, first order in epsilon. We want to show that Feynman's formalism gives the same prediction for this, the, the, the wave function, a very, very short time after t equals zero. So we start with uh, what the propagator must be. Uh, it must be this, where this integral goes over all space, minus infinity to infinity. And we take this u to be the uh, alleged propagator calculated in the Feynman formalism. Now epsilon is, there's epsilon there. Epsilon is a very, very short time interval. It's short enough so that we only have one time slice to worry about in the Feynman formalism, just one time slice. That means we don't actually have to do any integrals. Well, we do, but um, not in the Feynman sense. No, no functional integrals. Right, so we take, um, Okay, so we take uh, t1 minus t0 to be epsilon, obviously, and we evaluate the potential energy at the average position x plus x prime on 2. I think, uh, I think Shankar's got an exercise or uh, a little explanation why that is so. What if, that, what if you didn't have it in the middle? I don't want to get into that. You can read it for yourself. And the discretized action um, is... Uh, there's the there's half mv squared, and then the uh, this is the potential energy, and the potential energy is uh, it, it is just evaluated at the middle point, and so this is a this is actually a constant here. Um, the reason is that even though the potential energy might vary in space, uh, you, and you could uh, you um, You, you just you just want the, the you just want the, 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 the slice the time slice is so short that the distance of the particle would travel in that time would not be uh, great enough for the potential energy to vary much that's the idea and again you, you uh, integrate you, you evaluate the potential energy at the average average position so you write the one step propagator down and there it is. So this is the this is the sort of the, the alleged propagator. And now the Feynman formalism prediction is that if you substitute this into the integral up here, what it's supposed to do, then this psi of x epsilon is supposed to be the result of this integral. And we know what this is supposed to be according to Schrodinger, but the Schrodinger method. Uh, it must it must equal psi of x zero plus that, okay? That's what we're aiming for. Yes. Yeah, so there's a there's a second derivative of psi here, uh, etc. Et right. So we have to get this back. We have to recover this from that, okay? So um, the first thing to do is to change the variables. But we're going to use the method of stationary phase. <laughs> this thing here is a complex number of, of unit magnitude. That depends on the difference x minus x prime and also the mass 
there and Psalm, of course. Um, so, so we're going to rewrite all this here in terms of the difference x minus x prime and expand in terms of x minus that, that um, x minus x prime is going to be x prime minus x minus. <coughs> okay, so this complex space factor is rapidly varying except in the vicinity of x equals x prime. Oh, I'm, I'm pointing to the to the outside. You should have memorized it and imagined it. Oops, that's the wrong way. Here we go. <coughs> How well can you? Okay, there it can. Yes. But so, so that uh, this complex space factor uh, is um, is rapidly varying, except in the vicinity of uh, x equals x prime. There. So uh, that's going to be the, the stationary phase region, if you like. So eta is going to be x prime minus x and you expand everything and keep terms only the first order in epsilon to be consistent with uh, what we're aiming for and what, the, how we've set the problem up okay. so throw away all higher order terms in epsilon so and by the way this is a um, sort of a little side thing recognizing the small parameter in the problem immediately gives us a space-time region of coherence criterion um, that's up here so that's from here that m eta squared on 2h bar epsilon must be less than or about equal to pi so this modulus of epsilon has to be less than or equal to that uh, in other words it's basically Planck's constant square root of Planck's constant divided by the mass times the, the length of the time step okay so that's the distance away from uh, x uh, from, from the, um, the, the the EKB, that's the that's the amount that the part spreads out. The the actual the the the, the, the particle diffuses through space. Because the pi condition is, is why why do we take less than equal to pi? Because that's the that's uh, when you have that's where you have the coherent okay. coherent addition. This is minus. So this it's this region here gives oh. gives a coherent addition. All, 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 ang all angles, all angles um, in there give give coherent addition, positive addition. But we haven't really proven that. Yet. No, that's just a unit. That's just that's just um, a property of complex numbers. Or trig, trig functions, or whatever you want. Um, anyway, so in terms of this variable epsilon, the um, what we need, the prediction, if you like. Um, for what psi of x of psi is going to be is this integral when you have to um, deal with the fact that in here we have an exponential uh, in terms of epsilon there which this here contains uh, many, we'll, contains many powers of epsilon we'll keep this as it is because that's going to this factor here is, our, is, is, the, is what's going to uh, to make coherent or incoherent interference in the integrand. And here you've got the wave function psi of x plus epsilon the plus eta evaluated at zero at t equals zero. Um, and we're going to expand as <coughs> powers of eta and here and also this in powers of, of, of epsilon. And you're going to ignore uh, eta squared and onwards, and also uh, cross terms like eta, epsilon, etc. But epsilon, e, e, uh, uh, e, eta squared, etc. is okay. So psi of x plus eta expanded about eta equals zero is that, and the complex exponential here, um, if I just write out um, the power series for a complex exponential. I'll just keep the first two terms here, or well, the zero term and the first term there, and then and then here I expand this in powers of the, the potential energy in terms in powers of eta, but.
but I only keep the zeroth term because if I have the first term here, I have eta times potential energy times epsilon. So I have a product epsilon times eta, which is an order uh, too far. So we throw, so we don't need to expand this any further. So we only keep the zero term of the expansion there. So that's that. And then, um, so just plugging in um, what we've expanded here, we've got this factor at the front, which was up there before. Yeah, that, that was there from the start. And um, we have psi of x zero. This is the integral, the integration variable is d eta. So this is, this is a constant uh, with respect to the integration variable, but there's an eta up there. So we've got that minus that, and that's a constant as well. Um, so that, that there is a constant with respect to integration variable. That's linear with respect to the integration variable, but that's um, a Gaussian. And this is eta squared times uh, a, 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 an even function. So we have three integrals. We have, we have that constant <coughs> times that integrated over all space, or all possible eta's. And we have this linear term times that integrated over all space. And we have got the quadratic times that integrated over all space. And then d2 psi by dx squared comes out the front now because that's a constant with respect to the integration variable. And now this, now this thing here is a constant, so you can bring that out the front there. And all you have left is the integral over all eta of this exponential with eta squared multiplied and, and this out the front. But that is just, this here is a normalization for that Gaussian. So integral over all, uh, all eta's of that times that is one. So you're just left with this term in the brackets here. Okay. That's, that is just a normalization for that. So that's a normalized Gaussian there. So that gives you that. This is uh, even function times odd function. This is an odd function over an integral symmetric around the origin. So this integral is zero. And then this one is um, is just uh, just the formula um, from um, it's just a Gaussian integral, okay? Yeah. And so and so you get um, psi. So there's psi of x zero, psi of x zero, um, psi of x minus psi of x of psi of minus psi of x zero equals uh, minus i on h by epsilon um, comes there minus i h bar epsilon there uh, v of x zero psi of x zero that's v of x zero psi of x zero and then there's d2 psi by dx squared and the result of that integral just happens to be True. minus h bar squared on 2m. Look, I just have one question. Yeah. We expanded psi up to n squared Eta squared, eta. Well, that, that's eta. not an name, yeah. that's an eta. Eta squared because... Because um, what's the relation between order of... We, you said E terms only up to order epsilon, so what should we do about eta? Oh yes, 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 yes. Um, yes, it is. Uh, it's the e e eta is related. The size of eta is related to the size of epsilon. So keeping within the uh, coherence region, you, you expand only to eta. 
it, uh, expanding to eta squared is the same as is the same as the water on the yeah. 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 yeah, that's a good question. Thanks. Yeah. So and miraculously you get h bar squared on two m from from this thing here. This interval here. Okay, so it all works out. Okay, last thing is um, the propagator for particles moving with a potential energy of the general form. This quadratic in x and then x dot and x times x dot. So this is a velocity dependent, potentially, pardon the pun, um, velocity dependent potential energy. Right. So, yep. So that's, yeah. Hmm. Okay, whatever. In fact, uh, we're going to prove that this is easy to calculate apart from a factor, apart from the normalization factor, which is a function of time. So, uh, this is uh, last year, this was the extra lecture that we had on Thursday. So, I just did a little summary. So, you can read that summary for yourself. I don't, I don't feel that we need to spend any more time um, uh, on Thursday for this because we it's actually quite quick. Um, so so um, the first thing is that the actual variable of integration is going to be x of t double prime and what you want to do is just change variables so that you have like the, the classical path plus if you like a, a, a deviation from the classical path which is y of t double prime. So your new integration variable is going to be the deviation from the classical path as y of t double prime. And all the paths will agree on the endpoints yeah. at the end point. So you know, if you remember, if you go back to lecture one, right. we, did, we did the same thing. It's the error function. It's the error function, sort of like a deviation from the classical path, the same thing. So y of zero, y of the end, y at the initial time and y at the final time is zero. Um, and then let's use Feynman's scheme for evaluating the function of integral. So they partition the time interval into n subintervals, and then the intermediate integration variables, uh, which would normally be x of ti double prime, um, we, we just define as x, just to save our notation, xi is just going to be this, um, there's going to be these yi's defined like this. Now the dxi becomes dyi. And then in terms of the new path variable, um, the original functional integral, um, it, this is the exact integral um, here. Maybe I could put brackets around this. The space time, the original, um, in the original variables, the, the functional integral goes from the initial space time point x prime zero to the final space time point x of t. But in the new variable, the uh, we've, we're um, integrating over paths, the deviation paths, if you like, y of t double prime, and we're going from um, 0, 0 to 0 t. And in other words, um, what, we're, what we've actually got is that the propagator is going to be um, the integral um, from what, what's this kind, of, this kind of pair, 0, 0 to 0 t. Of, uh, of there's the um, complex number, it's got an e to the i on h bar times s, the, the action evaluated at the classical path plus the deviation path. And now we apply the method of stationary phase, and all that means is that we expand the exponent in here um, in a Taylor series about the classical path. So again, it's just redoing what we did in, uh, in lecture one, okay? Um, now since, okay, so, so the action is, is defined as that, then um, sort of doing it, so, so here it is, just uh, um, expanding uh, just to, uh, is expanding about the second, uh, this is to, to second, uh, this is to second. Uh, so there's the Lagrangian, 
uh, integral of zero to t, basically of Lagrangian um, um, This is the this this is the this is the action. This is the exact value. But what we want to do is expand about y equals zero, if you like, or the, the like the zero path sort of thing. So that becomes there's the zero term. There's a Lagrangian evaluated at the classical path um, and classical path to derivative of the classical path time derivative, and then there's um, the DL by the, the, the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x times y derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x dot times y dot evaluated at the classical path and the third term is going to be these the quadratic quadratic in y um, there's a second derivative of Lagrangian and there's y squared y y dot and y dot squared there and there's a, all of these are evaluated at the classical path um, but so I only keep the first two terms because we're going to be assuming that the Lagrangian has, oh, so the potential energy has the form um, that I just said. It's just the uh, it's just going to have that form there. So it's a special form. We're doing this only for this special form. So when you do that, see here you've got a d two l by d x squared. The Lagrangian in that very simple case is half mx dot squared minus that minus the potential energy of that special form. Then these terms here, right? This, that's d2l by dx squared. That's got to be minus c. There, d, d, d2l by dx squared is going to be the half half d2l by dx squared is minus c. There. D2L, D2L by dx dx dot is going to be minus E. D2L by dx dot squared is just going to be M. Or half, it's just going to be M. So these terms here are, are, are really simple, have a really simple form because of that potential energy. We chose whenever the potential energy has that form, okay? This, this first integral here is just the, is just the classical action. Um, now the second here is, 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 the, um, is the classical action, is the first variation of the classical action, which is zero by the principle of least action. Okay. And then the third term here has a very simple form because of the form of the potential energy that we chose. So, so what we have, the propagator is now out the front here. Out the front here is either the IH by times the classical action. Right. And then here you've got the rest of the integral to do. You've got this, this functional integral, which to prevent you put in a function, a path, the deviation path, if you like, and then for each of those you have to calculate the integral in the exponent, um, half m dot y dot squared minus c y squared minus e y y dot dt. Okay, now there's that, and. Um, now, what do you do now, and how do you argue it? And now you use intuition, and you say, well, hang on. Um, these paths here, this is an integral over all paths, all the uh, y paths, but the paths are statistically independent in the sense that um, if the par particle takes one y path, it doesn't pre uh, prevent um, passage through another y path. They're independent, completely independent. But what that means is that is that there cannot be any uh, space dependence of that integral. 
can't be any space dependence. Because if there's space dependence, it means that uh, some, it, if, it, if it depends on where you are in space, like a function of x, it means that some x's are more favored compared to other x's. But there isn't any, there can't be, there can't be because they are, there cannot be any favored x's in a sense of, um, the, the, the part of the can be independent, they're independent so they can't, they can't interfere with each other. I mean, they, they don't, they, they don't, um, uh, one is not way, uh, yeah. So what that means is that this can only be a function of time. So this whole integral, you, without even doing it, you know that it's just some function of time. So that means that you have this constant here, that's a constant, constant phase factor times some function of time. Right? And that's not a known, we don't know that what that function is. I mean, you could evaluate that and uh, in the assignment, you you will evaluate that for a harmonic oscillator. It, it's it's actually really easy. Right? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> if, if memory serves me correctly, it's either that or the, or the other problem is really easy. But I think the harmonic oscillator is is, is fairly easy. I, evaluating this is actually quite easy. So in many cases. Why is it statistically independent? As in what? Oh. Um, Basically, the claim is that all the all the spatial information gets uh, gets integrated out of this, and you're just left with the time time dependence. That's the claim. Um, yeah, that whole thing is just a function of time only, not of space. Because we have because we integrated over all space. Well. Yeah, but you might think, well, hang on, maybe uh, maybe some paths, um, <coughs> isn't it just that they made them out simply, or So you don't need an X in here. But overall, there is a spatial dependence, of course. Right? Um, because we just saw that there's some range. Well, this, the, the, the classical action. So uh, the classical action has all the spatial dependence. Yeah. Yeah. So that, so, OK. So um, Basically, the propagators, whatever the potential energy has the sim that particular form, that simple, that, that particular form, the propagator ends up being split up into just this constant factor multiplied by just some function of time. And then the other trick is finding the function of time. And um, for, uh, Shankar has a couple of exercises on this. One of them you do in the, in the assignment, next assignment. Why is it tricky? Why is it, don't you just find it? Just have to integrate that. In that. It's a functional integral. It's tricky, but it's a functional integral. 
Um, is, it, is it done in the same way discretizing and then um, No, you can just you can just plug it if you know if you know um, as in we need to evaluate this integral for every single path mm. and add them. Mm. So, sort of. mm. so it's not the it's not completely like the conventional mm. You'll see. Oops. You'll see. But well, the other thing is, uh, if you get to this situation, say in um, QFT, if next year you go to uh, Harada Sun's um, H lab or um, S lab or um, or E lab or something, and you get to this situation, uh, just just look up this book. Yeah. I mean that's yeah. I mean this bit here. So for the case for the free particle, C equals E equals zero. So C E is zero, so you just got half M Y dot squared integral zero to half M Y dot squared DT. Um, So what's the what's the point that we want to make? We know what A of T is, but not from here, because we just would uh, half M dot Y dot squared. The, it's just to show the next one. It says that B doesn't appear in the expression for time dependence. So any linear combination A plus B. X. Oh yeah, in there, yeah. B B is in there, so so the same thing must hold for um, B equals A plus B X. So even a linear uh, potential energy <coughs> potential energy that depends linearly on X. So it, that yeah, so so it doesn't actually appear in there. B doesn't appear in there, which means that is, that there holds for potential energy <laughs> like that. So that's just generalizing the free particle um, the free particle case. So the free particle case is also true if the potential energy is that. Yeah, does everyone, does it, do you get the argument, though? Mm. Yeah, the argument is that there is no A or B in here, mm. so that the A of T that we found for the free particle, which was that, the, the, the normalization of the free particle propagator, which was that, um, also holds for uh, any potential energy that that, that has a and B not equal to zero, which is A plus B X. Yeah? Because there's no difference. So we just, yeah, because it doesn't appear in there. Yeah. So we've generalized the free particle case to a non free particle, A plus B X, potential energy A plus B X. Yeah. Um, well, the last bit is just um, yeah, something about uh, method of stationary phase. All right, so uh, that will do.